seven years ago. I mean, this. Uh, how do you mark such a horrific anniversary? Every year is a little bit different. Um, there's the lead up before the, before the anniversary, actually. So April, you know, start feeling like the heaviness and the mood shifting. I always take time for like myself. I do something where I, I think about the victims. I think about the day itself. I kind of play it back. Some days I've gone on like hikes, just gotten away. I have a list of people that I always call. There's always that like the surgeon, the first responders, my really close friends. I still talk to a lot of the survivors as well. We kind of check in through text. What's interesting though about this year, this is the first year of actually speaking um, about the event. I mean, I've traveled and spoken extensively with law enforcement, but never before on the actual anniversary of the shooting. So this is a very different one. But whatever, I always tell people, whatever you need to do to remember it in, in a way that feels right to you is, is what you should do. And the best thing you can do is just prepare for it. So the 15th, you're not like, wait a minute, tomorrow's the day, what do I do? You kind of try to think about it before it happens. And when you close your eyes and look back at whatever kind of memories are the most glaring from seven years ago, what are the sure. images that flash in your head? It's actually the, the entire story is very glaring. I think the part that stands up the most is obviously the shooting itself, because when it's the day of and you start thinking of, well, this time seven years ago or eight years ago, whatever it will be, I was here, or this was about to happen. There's this very strong ominence of we didn't know how quickly it happened, that, you know, how quickly your life changed. What I always find interesting is the morning hours where, for all intents and purposes, I was the same careless 19 year old who almost skipped, who just was late to class, and then just like that, you know, it, it, it started very quickly. So I think about the moments of the shooting itself, and then for me, the second half of the day is very blurry because I was losing consciousness, I went to the hospital. I went into recovery, so that part it becomes less uh, emotional for me. Um, but the initial lead up and the actual shooting stays very, very vivid. You were late for school. Yeah. You almost missed your class. What, what almost, happened? We almost get to get coffee and a bagel because we had three classes back to back. We it was a French class. It was intermediate French. We walked in. We sat in the same exact seats we always did in the back left corner of the classroom. I talk about we were supposed to be rearranged because our teacher knew that people sat and we didn't really interact with other people in our classroom. Because we were late, we essentially had our, our seats saved for us and everyone else was moved about, really not with their things, their backpacks was all kind of dispersed. We sat there right after we walked in, a girl named Rachel Hill walked in. She was a freshman, very good student. We're like, Rachel, why are you late? She was part of the first shooting. So at 7.05 that morning on campus, our shooter walked from his dorm into a different dorm, her dorm, shot a girl, and her resident advisor, both were, were killed on the scene. When they released a the lockdown, she left the dorm. It's, you know, it's like 400 people live in that building, walked all the way across campus. She was one of the last people to get inside the building before he chained the doors. So our shooter chained the doors from the inside, and it's, it's horrible, absolutely horrible. He chained the doors, he wrote a note that said, if you try to break in, a bomb will go off. She walks in, she has no knowledge, she says there's been a shooting. And I, at that point, I remember thinking, well, someone let her out. So, you know, everything must be okay. Because at this point, we have no frame of reference about Newtown and Virginia Tech. And I'm sitting there with no laptop, no smartphone. It's just, okay, she's here. And literally after that, we, we heard the first gunshots. Um, I kind of felt them before I actually heard or saw them because he's in the hallway. It's a very narrow hallway, it's an engineering building, so he, some classrooms he had peered into beforehand to see which ones had the most amount of people in them, ours he didn't, and I just heard it outside, people thought it was construction, I didn't, I knew it was, I knew it was not construction because it was so loud and so alarming. My teacher went to the front of the classroom, she opened the door, she looked outside, and she quickly came back in, tried to close the door, and she said, call 911, and in that moment I just got on the floor. The desks we had were the ones that you would slide into. You know, you put your arm around and the book was underneath. So I got on the floor and I kind of hugged it. I put my stomach on the seat, my feet under it, my hands over my head. And looking back, I got that from like earthquake training when I was in, in California as a child. And I don't think she actually got the door closed. Like he actually just walked in. And he walked in shooting. Uh, it's really hard to convey like how quickly it happened. I mean, she's one of the first people that was shot as well as people that were right there. And he went across the room and just literally went down there was a people and just shot everyone individually, one by one. Um, multiple rounds were, were fired into each individual, but the first time it just right to left. And I wasn't, my eyes were closed, but I could hear and I could smell and I could sense because the force was kind of going towards me that I said to myself, brace yourself, your turn is gonna come. And I kind of you know, did this, I was wearing a white polo, so I remember seeing my arms clench and he shot me in the back the first time and then he left. He just, 
you know, he had us trapped in this very small space and he took advantage of that. And while he was in the other rooms, no one in our room is, is moving because everyone but one person is, is already wounded. People are coughing. It's, you know, the smell of gunpowder. It's a very small space. He came back. It was scarier because the first time he just fired right to left. It was very, very quick. He didn't have time to be afraid. He didn't have time to, you know, scream or, or think about what was happening. But the second time, he could sense that he was looking to see who was alive. And so I remember I was panting at this point because I've just been, you know, shot in the back. And it stayed in me. It didn't go through. Sometimes I think bullets do. And I was trying to hold my stomach in to pretend like I was, I was dead. And he shot above my head, which was incredibly scary looking back now because I looked up and I looked at the wall and I saw where the bullet hole was. And to this day, it's like, why did I move? I should have just, you know, played dead as, as I had. But um, yeah, all in all, he, came, he left for a third time. He came back again. So he came in three times, and in that time he shot me three times. So twice in the back, and then once in the toe. And it was, I think, about 10, 12 minutes of, of active fire. I mean, police, when they got there, I think before Virginia Tech, they had never had to worry about not being able to get in the door. Usually, like, you, you worry about getting there as quickly as possible. They, they were there on scene very quickly. They just couldn't get in because they didn't have the breaching tools needed. And students are trying to get out because they're scared as well. So they got in. He killed himself when he when he heard police, and he killed himself in front of our, of our classroom. So I didn't know that he was dead. I just thought, it's been so long that someone's been firing, or whatever the noise is, it's over. I have to move. So I pushed myself off the desk, and my friend who drove me to class that morning also shot, but more cognizant. I think he could see what was going on around us. He said, don't move, don't move. And I'm thinking, I've been hunched over for so long, and it hurts so much. I just I pushed myself off, and we just laid on the floor waiting for, for rescue, essentially. Was, was he saying anything? While he was shooting? No. He never said a single word. He never said anything when he walked in or, or during. Um, I mean, this was a planned attack. He, he knew what he was um, was out to do. And, and unfortunately, the, uh, the intention was to injure as many people as possible. So no, he didn't, he didn't say anything, at least in our room. I don't know about others. but. And what, is there any way of reliving what thoughts are going through your head in those 12 minutes? The only thoughts that were going on were, I think, I don't have to really hold on and just, it'll be over soon. It's so quick and so shocking and so scary that you don't have time to have um, logical thoughts. Because I couldn't have even told you that there was a shooting. I knew that something serious was happening. I thought it was an exercise. I thought it was like, uh, you know, like a social experiment where someone's going to jump out and say, okay, here we go. But I think by all, like I said, with each gunshot, there's a yelp, there's coughing, there's other signals that telling you that something is wrong. But I would have never have thought back then that what was actually happening was happening, right? We didn't have that like frame of reference. I didn't know what a gun even sounded like. That's why people say they thought it was construction noise. It was a little bit louder than that, but I would never have thought, oh, it must be a firearm. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't stick in reality. So part of my, my counseling was I would sit down and she'd say, you know, go from beginning to end. Tell us a story wherever you want to pick up. And to this day, the part about my mom is the part I always get a little bit teary-eyed about because I talk about going to the hospital. So, you know, they were overwhelmed with, with people and, and, and victims. And I got there. I gave them my mom's cell phone number, and they called her. My doctor called her. And he told her she was at, it was like 11 a.m. to the dry cleaners. She doesn't know yet there's been a shooting because the way that it was broken in the States was, you know, two um, victims in the morning and then it was like four and eight, but they, they hadn't, they didn't know yet how big of a, of a tragedy it was. So Dr. Lester calls her and, you know, she's going through a regular Monday morning, tells her your daughter's been shot, we have to operate and we can't wait for you. And she said she just like dropped to the floor, went home, grabbed my father, they got in the car and they jumped down. I was four hours from, from where they lived. The scary part more so is that later um, I say, well, why did dad drive so quickly? Why was he such, you know, so crazily? Thinking, again, I knew I was okay. And the answer is, well, we didn't know if you were going to be okay. We didn't know if you were going to survive. And to like think about those that moment in time where your parents actually have no clue if their daughter, like the fear and the panic and just the angst that she must have been going through. Like, for whatever reason, you still feel like as a daughter, right, of anyone, you owe it to your parents to be the one to deliver that information. Um, to think that my last word could have been to her some like sassy remark or some comment that didn't need to be said is just, it's horrible. And I knew there's nothing I, nothing I could have really done about that, but if there's any way I could take that 
time away from her and that pain um, and let her know that I was okay, I would. So as you can tell, yeah, that's the part that like, I've talked about it, I've gone through therapy. <laughs> um, it just doesn't, you know, you, you, it just shows you these events impact so many more people than just the people inside the building. Um, I think all the parents, all the siblings, I me, mean, everyone who was shot, a lot had, had families. And even more so students, to be in the building across the room from ours and to hear, because the gunshots were very loud, to hear that and to not know where your friends are, where your teachers are, it's such a bigger deal than numbers-wise and impact than just, you know, the, the 50 or so who were both you know, wo critically wounded and, and, and injured. It, these events are, they're horrible. And it, I think by not forgetting them is how we can protect them. You know, hope that it doesn't happen again, but it's um, it's definitely life changing. So yeah, to recover, it gets better for sure, but you never really fully erase that from from our memory. Even last, sorry, yesterday was the anniversary, and my mom is a very strong person, very you know move forward, kind of be happy, you're alive, very positive. Um, she cried over Skype because this day means something else to her than it does to me. It's this day that she almost lost her daughter.